Thank you. Uh, Mr. Ellison is our next speaker. As I said, he will address the issue of inequality in this country. Give us uh, his perspective on what that means. Uh, so let me introduce you, uh, Mr. Congressman. Uh, we're, we're very glad that you're here. Uh, Mr. Ellison represents Minnesota's fifth congressional district in the U.S. House of Representatives. The fifth district includes the city of Minneapolis and surrounding suburbs and is one of the most vibrant and ethnically diverse districts in Minnesota. Representative Ellison's guiding philosophy is based on generosity and inclusion. And his priorities in Congress are building prosperity for working families, promoting peace, pursuing environmental sustainability, and advancing civil and human rights. Representative Ellison's commitment to consumer justice led him to write legislation that was included in the Credit Cardholders Bill of Rights of 2009. This law prevents unfair practice, an unfair practice called universal default, which allowed lenders to increase their customers' interest rates if they had late, late payments with another lender. In response to the foreclosure crisis that began in 2008, Representative Ellison also wrote the Protecting Tenants in Foreclosure Act, which requires banks and other, own, uh, other new owners to provide at least 90 days notice of eviction to renters occupying foreclosed homes. As a member of the House Financial Services Committee, the Congressman helps oversee the nation's financial services and housing industries, as well as Wall Street. He also serves on the House Democratic Steering and Policy Committee, which decides committee assignments for Democratic members and sets the Democratic Caucus policy agenda. In the past, he served on the House Judiciary Committee and the House Committee on Foreign Affairs. Representative Ellison was elected co-chair of the Congressional Pro uh, Progressive Caucus for the 113th Congress that promotes the progressive promise of fairness for all. He is also a member of the Congressional Black Caucus, founded the Congressional Custom Consumer Justice Caucus, and belongs to more than a dozen other caucuses that focus on issues ranging from social inclusion to environmental protection. Before being elected to Congress, Mr. Ellison was a noted community activist, like a lot of you, and ran a thriving civil rights, employment, and criminal defense law practice in Minneapolis. He also was elected to serve two terms in the Minnesota State of, uh, House of Representatives. He was born and raised in Detroit, Michigan, has lived in Minnesota since earning his law, law degree from the University of Minnesota Law School in 1990. And Mr. Ellison is the proud father of four children. We're very glad to have you here, Mr. Ellison. Thank you. Thank you. How you doing, housing, housing advocates? You guys ready to fight for housing? Good, because we sure need that. We need that spirit and your dedication and commitment to making sure that everybody has a safe, affordable place to live is uh, more important than ever. And I'm going to tell you that uh, you know and I know that when you start talking about the order of needs for families, you know, housing has got to be right up near the top. You know, uh, one time somebody said to me, you know, housing, housing is like so fundamental. It's like, it's like trying to make a cake without a bowl. Think about that. You're trying to make a cake, but you got no bowl to mix up the eggs and the flour and the milk in. So what do you do? You just try to keep it going on the flat surface. It runs over here. It runs over there. And what ends up happening is that you end up with a mess sometimes. Providing housing gives people a sense of place, a sense of dignity, a sense of belonging. It helps their mental and emotional health, and it allows them to grow and thrive in their family. It allows them to have better physical health as well as emotional health. And so the work that you do is so much more important than, you know, square foot, square footage, and, uh, you know, what the, what the kitchen looks like and how how many bedrooms there are, it's so much bigger than that because you and I know that our people raise their families in these places that we fight to help them have. And 
you know, I remember so well that I was talking to a guy who was right about my age. I'm 53. And he was, uh, his family was losing their housing. And his little girl walked into the room and she said, you know, uh, you know, Daddy, are, we have to leave. Uh, is that right? He said, yeah. He said, she said, you're going to have to take down your posters because this is not going to be your room anymore. And you're going to have to, in this place where we used to measure how tall you were getting, well, that's not going to be your doorway anymore. And so I just want to just, beyond the numbers, you guys get statistics, don't you? Oh, goodness, do we ever do statistics. Beyond the numbers, we got to have a heart connection with what we're doing when we fight for housing. You agree with me on that? Yeah. Absolutely. Now, let me just be clear. Um, housing in America is upside down. The way we fund housing and get per dis distribute housing benefits is all mixed up. Uh, do we have a slide for that, Carol? You know, our housing, we spend about $100 billion on public benefits for housing in the form of tax, uh, tax, um, uh, tax breaks, uh, the biggest being the mortgage interest deduction, about $70 billion for that. And then when you add on the other benefits, it goes up to about 100. The total budget of HUD, every penny, is about 41 billion. The mortgage interest deduction, and other uh, housing home ownership benefits that people get only go to folks who own homes. And the bigger the house, the more benefit you get. And yet, when it comes to the people who need Section 8, public housing, they tend to fight for what the state can provide in the limited budget of the federal government. In fact, the wealthier and more well-to-do you are, the more housing benefit you're probably going to get in our country. When the truth is, many folks, I'm not saying that we should not provide housing benefits to people who are more middle class and upper middle class and even rich in some cases. I am saying that if we want to have a ladder of opportunity and we want to be the land of opportunity, we should make sure that the housing benefit from the public is going to the people who need it most. In fact, we have the numbers all flipped upside down, and I think it's going to take a big Herculean test to set them aright. But if we do, we can put our country on a trajectory of real middle class prosperity. Now, this is true whether or not you're dealing in the urban world or in the rural community of America. Rural America is a beautiful place. My mother and father are from rural America. You ask my mom about her fondest times of her life, she will tell you growing up in rural Louisiana, you wake up in the morning and you hear the birds sing. She loved being a rural person and she enjoyed living in rural America. Of course, employment drew her to the city. But many people who live in rural America, as you know, would prefer to be in rural America. The real question is, will we invest in rural America so that they can stay where they are and want to be? Rural America, like urban America and suburban America, needs housing investment. Absolutely. But it also needs broadband everywhere so people can do employment and recreation and do what everybody else does online. It also needs transportation. Rural transportation is a serious hurdle and is connected very tightly with housing. We need a rural program that allows Americans who live in the wider spaces to be able to thrive and grow. Now, there are some places where this is happening, but there's many, many more places where things are much tougher. And I think we've really got to dig into that. Because if we will invest in rural America, not only will we improve the lives of people who live there, we will prevent sprawl, overcrowding, and we will be able to have a thriving, growing country where everybody can succeed. And I think it's important to understand that rural America is a diverse place. You got rural America where there's a lot of white folks who live there. You got Native Americans in rural America. You got Latinos in rural America. You go to Mississippi, Louisiana, you got a lot of black people living in rural America. So it's important to keep in mind when you think rural America, not to do a stereotype. 
Rural America is diverse. Rural America is creative, and rural America fights back. And rural America needs some help, just like everybody else. And so I think that it is a time to make the call. And in this political environment, when in many ways, President-elect Trump can attribute his success to what happened in rural America, honestly, I think rural America should make some demands. I think so. I think so. Because of all, because you know, politicians make claims all the time before the election. And they better figure out how to keep some of them promises after the election. If you look at who's getting in that uh, cabinet, I think we got our work to do to help convince the president that he needs to take care of the people who took care of him. Now, I just want to say, you know, that, that, that it is critically important to, to note as we talk about rural America that rural poverty rates higher than in the urban areas. Now, we think of poor inner city, don't we? That's our stereotype. But poverty in rural America and even growing increasingly in suburban America uh, is, 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 uh, is, is, a is a real thing. And we've got to sort of help educate people into understanding this reality. And it's critically important that we do that. And part of our mission as we leave this important conference will be to go help people on Capitol Hill and in the state capitals and in the city councils all across this country understand the truth and the reality of rural America, its needs, its opportunities, and how it can thrive even more with a little bit of, with a little bit of investment. Now, I want to tell you that uh, there are people in, on Capitol Hill who are fighting for, for rural housing, uh, urban housing, housing in general. Uh, the Progressive Caucus will publish our budget for all around March. I want to invite you, and I'm making this invitation to you right now, to help us formulate our budget so that it has the needs, wants, desires of advocates of rural housing. We're formulating that budget now. March is going to be here in a finger snap, and you should know that you have an open invitation to contribute to our budget. Our budget is not a document that a bunch of Congress people sit around and write. It is a document that we encourage our progressive and uh, activist friends to help us write. So if they, we want to have the best ideas for rural housing in our Progressive Caucus budget, so I want to say to you right now, you have an open invitation to tell us what needs to be in there. And while we're at it, you ought to put your ideas in the Republican budget. You ought to put them in the Democratic budget, Senate, anywhere. You ought to put your ideas in as many places as you possibly can get them, because that's how you increase the likelihood of success. But we want to be your advocate on Capitol Hill. So please put us in your, in your, uh, in your, um, uh, in your sights when you decide on what demands you want to make on this federal government of ours. I can tell you that a closed mouth does not get fed. And people on Capitol Hill, they get what they go lobby for. And the American system is designed to be lobbied. And anyone who thinks that Congress is gonna deliver good outcomes based on just what's right and wrong is mistaken. Congress delivers outcomes based on who goes down there, gets in the face of that member of Congress and says, this is what we got to have. This is what we need. And then politicians will see the light once they feel the heat that you're going to bring their way. All right? All right. I like it. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I just want to tell you, you know, before I go into some, some of the ideas that I want to share with you is that. I think that it is a very important for you all, and I know you're all incredibly busy because the work you're doing is just, it's really, it's really quite a bit, but I want to invite you and urge you to, uh, to read a book I read recently called Evicted. Anybody read Matthew Desmond's Evicted? This is a good book, is it not? But you know what? I haven't read the rural housing version of Evicted. Maybe somebody in this room today will take on that task. Because evicted is about urban housing crisis in Milwaukee. But you know what? There's an equal crisis across rural America. And I bet you there is an important story to be told. 
part of what you must do is to write about the people you're fighting for every day. I know you're in the meetings and you're designing and you're pulling together plans for better housing, but as you do it, take a little extra time to get some stuff in the local newspaper, into your podcast, into your blog about the, real, the reality of housing because part of the reason that we're not having the success that I would like us to have is because people just don't understand what we're fighting for and writing important books and speaking is key. Does anybody here have a radio program on rural housing? Maybe we, what do you think? Time to get one, right? Does anybody have an, a column they write for a newspaper on rural housing? See, I'm telling you, if you don't tell your story, somebody else is going to tell it for you. And maybe their story is going to be, you're fine. Is that the story you want? No. <laughs> so think about how we message so that we can get on the, atten on the, on the, uh, get to the top of the pile for our, uh, for, in terms of policy initiatives and agenda. This book, Evicted, has really made a lot of waves, and I'm telling you that the, the, the rural version of Evicted is waiting to be written. Maybe you can write it, and it is something that has to happen. But if you're more of a talker than a writer, get a blog, get a TV show, get a, get, get a cable access show on rural housing. There's a lot of stories to be told. Would you agree? Yes. Now, now, one of the things I want to tell you is, uh, is a piece of legislation that I really hope that you guys can support. It's called the Common Sense Housing Investment Act. And uh, this bill, H.R. Uh, 1662, I never know them by the numbers, but uh, this bill would address what I believe is one of the biggest problems in housing, which is that we direct our funding toward people who need it the least. For decades, politicians have been told the mortgage interest deduction was the third rail of American politics. If you talked about that or thought about changing it in any way, people would get really upset and you would end your political career. As a person who has messed with that third wheel, I'm here to tell you that's not true. <laughs> it's not true. You can survive questioning the mortgage interest deduction. You know, so no politician is going to destroy their career by curbing $70 billion plus a year tax benefit the government gives to homeowners through the mortgage interest deduction. At least that's the common wisdom. The truth is we've already begun to question it, and we've survived it so far. Even when I talk to more well-to-do people and tell them we need to make reforms, they're open to the conversation. We need to drive this dialogue. You need to drive this dialogue. About 80% of the benefits go to families that earn over $100,000. Well, four years ago when I introduced a bill that replaced this regressive tax break with more equitable 15% tax credit, my bill uh, has been, we've had some great conversations about it, and one of the things you should know is that a lot of people in conservative think tanks have been thinking about getting rid of the mortgage interest deduction for a long time. This proposal keeps the money in housing and preserves a benefit uh, as in the form of a credit. So it really does, really does work. So my bill lowers the cap on the maximum benefit to interest on a mortgage from 1 million to 500,000, so we lower the cap. And so to anyone in the audience with a $5 million mortgage, you can only get a tax benefit on your mortgage interest of up to 500,000. <laughs> All of you guys with the $5 million mortgage, you still can get a, cre uh, a, so a benefit of up to half a million. But we really are subsidizing the houses of the uh, Donald Trumps and Mark Zuckerbergs of this country. Does that make sense? No. So I've introduced this bill now two more times, and, I, and as I mentioned, I got reelected last time by 70% of the vote. So it's not a third rail. It's actually smart to really review the wisdom of this policy. Um, it's smart policy, uh, I believe, and supported by more than 2,300 groups, including the Housing Assistance Council. So that's awesome. So my bill would provide over $200 billion over 10 years for affordable rental housing for low-income families. $200 billion. What could you do with $200 billion to house your people? What could you do? You could do some real stuff, right? Not, and not waste any of the money. I'm not talking about squandering money. 
I'm talking about meeting the unmet needs. You know, one thing, just let me digress for a quick moment. A few years ago, we looked at all the public housing stock across in the United States. And they did an inventory on all the unmet, the unmet maintenance needs. Came up with about $28 billion. When Congress was at its high water mark, it went great guns. You remember the stimulus bill a few years ago? When we went great guns, when we went the full way and just really put money into uh, public housing maintenance, we did $4 billion. Do you understand? We're not anywhere close to meeting the needs of the people in public housing. $200 billion would make a lot of elevators work properly, a lot of light fixtures work properly, it would get a lot of mold clean out of a lot of apartment buildings, and it would make people's lives better, healthier, and safer. Double what the federal government currently spends on affordable rental housing. By converting home ownership benefit to a flat rate credit, we can help more current homeowners. Homeowners, again, this is not renters versus homeowners. People always want to pit these two groups against each other. They both live in the neighborhood, right? And so the fact is we need help for both. But the truth is this is not an I win, you lose situation. This is an I win, you win situation. If people in living in rental housing and that housing is clean, safe, and affordable, that makes the homeowner's asset more valuable too. So by converting the home ownership benefit to a flat rate credit, we can help more current homeowners, 16 billion who have a mortgage now but don't itemize because the mortgage interest deduction only goes to people who itemize. So we can help millions of low-income elderly, veterans, we, people with disabilities, families with kids find safe, affordable home. We can expand the low-income housing tax credit by 20% if we make this change. We could provide billions for Section 8 rental assistance and public housing capital fund, as I just mentioned. We could provide a source for permanent funding for the National Affordable Housing Trust Fund. We can, <clears throat> we can help millions of families move off waiting lists into good homes. In my own hit city of Minneapolis, they tell me that they got at least about 8,000 8, people on the waiting list for public housing, another five or 6,000 on the waiting list for Section 8. You know, we're talking about 13,000 low-income people looking for somewhere to have a permanent, safe, affordable home. And I would imagine everybody in this room could tell a similar story. Am I right? Everybody. Let's stop doing that. Let's do something else. Let's address inequality and understand that one of the main ingredients in American inequality in late 2016 is inadequate, unaffordable housing. If you want to make America more equal and more fair, if you want to help working people meet their goals, you, we got to address housing. It's just not a matter of the minimum wage, although it is. It's just not a matter of be, getting paid on overtime fairly, though it includes that too. It's just not a matter of being treated fairly as a consumer and not getting ripped off with uh, unfair products. Part of it is housing too. We can talk about a lot of things, but unless we fix this housing nugget and get people in safe, affordable, clean homes that do not eat up all their income, we are going to continue to suffer with this inequality, which I believe is really hurting not just individual people, but it's hurting our national narrative as a people, as Americans. Because you know and I know rent eats first, right? And if the rent is 50% of the family income, that's, that is that are school books not being paid. Those are student activity fees not being paid. That's good, decent meals being paid. You know, when poor people get a little bit more money in your pocket, you know what the first thing they usually do? Buy groceries. Buy groceries. Better nutrition, better health, fewer medical bills. But I just want to close on saying this. We, if I was to ask you a question, and I want, this is audience participation time. Describe to me with one word and only one word how you would describe our country, America, at its best. At, I mean, I, we can talk about things that didn't go well, but when we are at our best, the one word that kind of describes us is what? Come on, help me out. Opportunity, fair, caring, team. 
Right, inclusive. So the hope, now these, these words are all words that speak of a path that a person can take to lead a fulfilling life. But because of income inequality and wage stagnation, we are not, we are, the practical reality is our great country, which all of us love, is ceasing to be the land of opportunity, is becoming the land of stagnation because people feel stuck. And when they feel stuck, they feel angry. When they feel angry, sometimes they vote in a way that flips the whole table on everybody. You know what I mean? They're like, okay, I'm going to vote for this guy. I'm going to show y'all. And you know what? They showed us. <laughs> and it is time, 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 time to listen. Time to listen to that single mom trying to raise her kids. Time to listen to that young dad who works all day, but, you know, works all night, but just can't make it on the pay that he's been getting. It's time to listen, and I believe that you all who are the fierce fighters for people who live in rural housing are going to lead that fight. I believe you guys are the vanguard and the front of the battle, and that our way forward to an inclusive, prosperous America that helps lift the boats of everybody is in this room. So if you're ready for that fight, I am too. Thank you guys for everything you do. What what uh, Moises says um, uh, offer, offered to take a few questions. I'd be happy to answer a few. I got some more bills to talk about. I didn't want to just bore you with legislation, though. There's a mic over there. If somebody's making their way to a mic, oh yeah, there we go. Okay. Yes, sir. If you are elected as DNC chair, right, will you have a rural agenda? You know, Democrats don't normally have a rural agenda. Will you have one? Absolutely. We're going to have a rural agenda at the front of the agenda. Um, first, we're going to have a rural agenda because it's right and just to have a rural agenda. But we're also going to have a rural agenda because we don't want nobody to divide us. Right? You know, can we do something? Can we stop using terms like Rust Belt? Can we stop using terms like flyover country? I'm from Minnesota. I resent the idea that my only value is that people can get from New York to Los Angeles over my head. <laughs> and let me tell you, right, and let me just tell you, we use the term Rust Belt, and I don't think people mean anything nasty by it, but if you rust, are you rusting out? I'm not rusting out. Anybody in here rusting out? Are the people you fight for every day rusting, not rusting out? This idea that rural America is some sort of second class is a bunch of crap. We should not accept it. And if I am DNC chair, I will. And you want to know the irony of it all? Just uh, more than half of them folks living in the city, either they come from rural America or their parents do. Isn't that right? Absolutely. Anybody else? Uh, okay, you guys are... You got, Well, here, let me just talk about the new administration for a minute. Um, now, you asked me a question, so I'm going to give you my answer. Okay? Um, I'm not nonpartisan. <laughs> <laughs> so I believe that um, the president-elect was a very, very skillful messenger and communicator and said a lot about jobs, a lot about new trade models, and a lot about investment in infrastructure. Um, and now he probably has the richest, most billionaire cabinet anybody ever will have. You should know that. The likelihood that the guy who helped preside over the housing crisis of 2008 is now going to be an advocate for housing. But you didn't ask me how bad it was. You asked me what we could do given the situation. I think this. I'm going to always be for anyone, and I don't care who it is, if they're trying to do something good for Americans. So if he's actually there to do good for Americans, we're here to partner to do good for Americans. But you can't just say you're going to do good for Americans and not actually deliver for Americans. My advice is you should offer him a, you should send him an invitation to address your group. Right? 
you should send him an invitation to address your group to come speak about rural housing. The second thing is you should have the HUD secretary come here to talk about what he's going to do for rural housing. You should ask, you should make sure you make good points about what, see, here's the thing, you actually know something about rural housing. And when somebody comes in and says, we're going to lift financial restrictions so that the payday lenders can have more freedom of movement, that's not, I don't think that's a recipe for success. When they say they're not going to hold the manufacturing housing industry and mortgage in the, in the finance industry for the manufactured housing industry, and they're going to let them charge people 14 over prime, stuff like that, you should say that's not helping our people. You should help them understand that when they make a policy proposal, it better actually be something that's really going to help. And as I said this, working with the administ new, new administration, you got to be careful. Don't let it, somebody do give, give a quarter, a 25% decent little proposal and then so that they can give you a bunch of zeros after that. So make sure that when they make a proposal that it's a good one. And before you sign up to it, make sure it's a good one. You will know whether it's a good one because this is what you guys do every single day. But what I would not do is close off communication. Absolutely ask them to talk. Tell them you want to talk to them. You're not going to get anywhere by not talking. Talking will do one of two things. It'll get you where you want to go, or it'll make it clear that you're not going to get where you want to go. Clarity is a blessing. You understand what I mean by that? Sometimes knowing who you're dealing with is good, because then you know what you have to do. But once they can keep you off balance, and you think they might help you, but they're not really, they haven't really done it, and they're, now you're off balance and you're not really making plans to move forward. So I think communication is key. Uh, and I also think what I said before is very key. You absolutely have to say, Mr. President, you made certain promises. It's time for you to deliver on them promises. Here's our agenda. We want to move forward on it. When can we sit down and talk about implementation? Communicate, communicate, communicate. Keep the lines of communication only. Call out the nonsense. Let me tell you, tax cuts for rich people have not benefited the middle class and the poor folks. Can we agree that trickle-down economics doesn't work? Okay. Never has, never will. But it has amassed great fortunes for certain small individual, group of individuals. So that's my proposal. Don't shut off communication, but don't take any... Uh, any any weak stuff just in order to be bipartisan, in order to look like you're being cooperative. Don't look like you're being cooperative. Actually be cooperative based on something that's mutually beneficial for everyone. Does that make any sense to anybody? All right. Uh, maybe we got one more. Uh, yes, sir. The Urban Rural Coalition in Minnesota that's that's preserve the progressive politics of Minnesota. Yep. What do you think that provides the rest of the country, being one of those rural areas that was actually blue? Well, here's the thing. You know, uh, the Iron Range of Minnesota has this tremendous history. I mean, it was 1916 that uh, miners, who really did come from the whole world, whole wide world, uh, Slovenia, Finland, they came from uh, the Ojibwe, you know, community and right there in, in Minnesota. They came from all over the world. To, uh, my, to, to be miners. And they would see their fellow workers getting killed in the mines on such a regular basis that, uh, you know, it became a routine. And so they began to organize themselves and had some great miner strikes in 1916. That experience helped forge a regional identity. And uh, I think that, um, you know, every state has this. You know, let me tell you, Texas has a great tradition of you know, prairie populism. You know, uh, Kansas has the same thing. Uh, you know, um, Michigan has it. Ohio has it. Well, we, all, we all have our version. You know, Wisconsin, fighting Bob La Follette. Anybody from Wisconsin here? You know, what, you know what I'm talking about? We need to draw upon these traditions. Remember that there was a time that we really did put the best interests of the people forward. And I just want to say this, and this is, I think, is real important. If People, we're now debating, do we go left or do we go right? I think we got to go deep. 
Because if you get in touch with people and understand what they're really going through, those people will tell you what you need. And it'll have something to do with fair wages, fair pay, prosperity for all, and holding the rich, powerful, special interests accountable and put some rules and restrictions on them so that they got to live within this democracy. And so I think that that, that really does offer a model, but I will tell you that there's a lot of models around the country. We don't, Minnesota has ours, but you got yours in the state you, you come from and draw upon it. And just remember, if you, sit, if, if you sit down with those folks all across the districts that you represent and, 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 and serve, they're gonna tell you what they really need. And I know that uh, Secretary Vilsack's gonna talk to you about the opioid epidemic. This is a sign of pain. This is self-medication. People are dealing with what's ailing them. If we will listen, I'm telling you, democracy has solutions to solve this pain. Because what people are hurting because they feel like they're just accepting a lot of stuff that they cannot control, and so they deal with it in this other way. And so what I'm saying is, what if, what if we actually gave the therapy of activism, grassroots activism? What about that? What about getting out in the street, getting going down to that bank that's foreclosing? What about, you know what I mean? That has a therapeutic effect. Has anybody ever here walked a picket line or been in a march or does it feel good a little bit? Just to be doing something to solve the problem can actually lift you up. And I think that activism can really help our rural communities. And we have a long tradition of it in this country. In, United, in Minnesota, we got, I'm, do you guys know I'm not a Democrat? I'm a, I'm a DFLer. I'm a Democrat farmer labor. The party I belong to is the DFL. F stands for farmer. So I'm telling you, let's draw upon these traditions, whether they're in Mississippi, Missouri, Montana, Minnesota, Maine, or California or Washington or anywhere else, Florida, we have our traditions of organizing on the ground, uniting for mutual benefit, and we have changed this country several times, and we're about to do it again. But it's going to take unity. Don't let people divide us. Don't let people divide us. Don't let anybody tell you that, well, you know, we can't worry about, you know, women and people of color and gays. We just got to focus on, you know, working class white men. You know, let me tell you something. There's a whole lot of working class white men who hate racism, sexism, and don't like it. And they don't want to sit, they don't want, they're like, they're, they're not saying, yeah, help me, screw everybody else. No, we need to develop a politics that says we can all win and we can all succeed. And in fact, we all do better when we all do better. This is the kind of politics that the 2017 and 18 and 19 and 20 absolutely demand. And if we allow people to break us up into factions and tribes, we're all going to suffer. So one of the things that I want to ask you to do as you, go, as you leave this conference and go back across America is put it within your heart to say we are going to unify people. We're going to respect people. We're going to uplift human dignity. All colors, every, both genders, every background, all religious affiliations. This is how we win. This is how we win. I think that's all I've got time for. I'm so proud of you guys. I'm so honored you all let me come spend a little bit of time with you. Uh, I just want to let you know that I do have a bill. I, wanna, I just want to tell you about this one because I think we can pass it pretty quick. It's called the Credit Access and Inclusion Act. You know, a lot of your folks who you fight for and represent, um, they pay the, te the telecom bill on time. They pay the rent on time. They pay a lot of non-loan bills on time. You, you following me? And yet, if they're late on those bills, it'll hurt their credit score. But if they pay those bills on time, it doesn't help their credit score. We're trying to do something called full file, which means that if I pay my non-loan non -loan bills on time, that's going to benefit me and help build my credit score. If we were to do that, literally millions of Americans' credit score would go up. And, credit, and this didn't, a lot of people, you need a good credit score even if you don't want to borrow no money. Now they're talking about whether they're going to underwrite you for insurance, whether or not they're going to rent you an apartment, whether you're going to get a job, or if you want a cell phone, whether you're going to pay a big deductible or not. These are all very important things. So this thing is called the Credit Access and Inclusion Act. 
And I got a podcast coming out about it in a few days. It's called, my podcast is called We The Podcast. We The Podcast. It's on iTunes. And it's all about how people who are not in the millionaire and billionaire class engage in this economy. And I hope you guys check it out sometime. Anyway, be well. Much love. And uh, let's get out there. All right.